There once was a king who'd ruled for many years. He'd seen many generations come and go. He'd seen many different lands, many different people. And together they'd come so far. But he'd become old now. And he faced a difficult dilemma. Who should become heir to this throne that he'd amassed? The king had three sons who were triplets, making this an even more tricky decision. And each of those sons was equally capable, equally wise. He'd given them everything. And so he decided to set them a challenge, a test, to see how resourceful they could be. As the members of his court gathered to hear what his decision was, he said to them, I've decided to set you a challenge. And the challenge is this, my sons. I'm going to give each of you one bronze coin. And there is an empty room in my palace. And using this one bronze coin, you must fill this empty room with whatever you wish. You have one week. And so each of the sons went away, approaching the task in a different way. And finally, the day of the competition arrived. And the first son spent his bronze coin and paid his lowly servant and said, I want you to take all the things, all the possessions that I own, the bigger the better, and I want you to fill this room. And so the servant filled the room. It was filled halfway. The second son, he was a little bit smarter, a little bit more cunning. He went to his local farmer and used his power and prestige, his influence, to bargain with the farmer and bought every single bale of hay that the farmer had. As each bale of hay was loaded into this room, it was filled three quarters of the way. He felt confident. I'm about to become the next king, he thought. And so, as the sun began to set and the competition began to draw to a close, finally this last son arrived. And he came, and he had nothing. No barrels, no wagons, no servants. And everybody looked and wondered. The king walked up up to him and whispered, Son, aren't you going to fill this room with anything? He simply looked at him and smiled and took out a small box from his pocket and said, Yes, my father, I'm going to fill this room with light. The moment that I left my education, the moment that I graduated, I had but one thought on my mind. And that was a bit like when you eat loads of crisps, like some of you may have in the break. You feel full, but you don't feel nourished. And so I felt that my education wasn't complete, this person that I wanted to become. I wasn't any closer. There were still things that was missing. And I'd spent seven years in education. I'd spent £27,000 on this degree. I'd collected GCSE certificates. I'd been through the process of sitting, sitting exams, getting rejected by all my universities, going through clearing, ending up at university, and now at the pinnacle I felt like something was missing. And so I realized, just like the prince in this story, that I needed to be resourceful. I needed to take matters into my own hands. The curriculum that I wanted, quite simply, didn't exist. You know something's wrong when you're paying nine grand for a degree and you're spending more time in the club than a library or a lecture. And so the questions that I was asking myself, how do I become mentally strong? What's going on in Israel and Palestine? How do I even understand the politics of this country? Do I even want to vote? What's the point? There were so many real-life questions that I had, and I needed answers. And so I decided to take things into my own hands. I went to Botswana, where I learned about HIV and AIDS. I went to Bangladesh, where I learned about leadership in different countries. I went to a 10-day meditation retreat to build up my mental strength and learn about Anicca, the principle of accepting what manifests itself before you. I came back to the country and learned about coaching, social enterprise. And I was able to visit all these places. And ironically enough, I developed more than I'd ever developed before. I grew more than I'd ever grown before. My character grew. And I'd spent not a single penny. I think that education today, we know that there are so many challenges with it. But for me, the most damaging thing of all is that we're not creating social reformers. People who can critically challenge and break the cycle of conformity. People like Malcolm X, Bhagat Singh, Rosa Parks, where are they? We need people who can challenge, not just conform. People who are active, not just passive. 
And so I've had the pleasure of working with young people in a variety of sectors and settings all over the world, and I've noticed the pattern. The same challenges and problems that I'd faced, many other young people face as well when they're transitioning into adulthood. And this phase is known as the quarter-life crisis. I like to categorize this quarter-life crisis into two main aspects, civic and personal, big decisions for me and big issues for the world. And so looking at personal development, this big decisions for the world, every generation has its own common characteristics, some psychologists believe. And so our generation, Generation Y, we're more civic-minded than any generation before. 30% of young people in the UK have spent their free time volunteering and setting up social action projects. Yet at the same time, we have higher expectations than ever before. We feel more entitled to success. We want to get things right the first time. And at the same time, the symptoms of this, one in four young people will experience a mental health issue, anxiety or depression. We have the highest rate of self-harm in Europe. The leading cause of death at university is suicide. Most of us in this room, the graduates who are paying all this money for these degrees, we struggled to pay them into our 60s, and the average age that we're going to spend living at home has now gone up to 36. What's the point? And then looking at the other hand, civic, the world, there's so many challenges and issues in the world. We see pollution, has been mentioned before. We see the increased surveillance, conflict, poverty, HIV, AIDS, an impending resource crisis. People are living longer, and there's less stuff to go around. What do we do? For me, education doesn't address these things. Are they important or not? And when education is at its best, I believe it does three things. It has three qualities. It draws out from what is within, rather than trying to stuff things in. It's drawing out the natural resources within you. It acts like a great equalizer. Information has the capacity to change your situation. So no matter where you are, whether you're at the bottom or the top, you can change your situation. And finally, and most importantly, it must liberate you and liberate others. And an example of this, this critical thinking that I talked about, if you look at the human brain, on average we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. And these mostly occur in patterns of thinking, of speech, and action. And so our thinking affects our speech, and our speech affects the way that we act. And these patterns continue to run in cycles. And so if we accept that you are what you consume, what do you think happens when you're listening to music over and over again? Look at the top 25 of your most played on your iTunes list. What are the songs on there? If we look at the most highest selling single of 2013 and of 2012, I'm not even going to look at the lyrics because 70% of communication is nonverbal. So it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You tell me what is being communicated here. Is it giving you power or is it taking it away? Taking this further, the influence of the media on young people. There was a study done in January 2006 which found that when a person under 16 watched more than the monthly average of 23 alcohol adverts in a month, they were likely to drink more by 1%. So you saw the lyrics in the previous slide. There was a reference to Patron. What do you think is happening there? Who is in power? The record label, the drinks owners, or you? And so, what's the solution? What do we do? Where do we go from here? I believe that we're living in the time of re, that there's a zeitgeist of taking responsibility, of being resourceful, of rethinking, of recycling. We don't need something completely new. We just need to tweak it, make an adjustment, and it's in our hands. We are this generation. And we're seeing this death of the singular fixed authority and entity that we depend on to fulfill our needs in every section of society, and the growth of these collaborative communities, crowdsourced. So for example, you've got things like Airbnb, couch surfing, where you can sleep on a stranger's couch for free. You can sign a petition on a vase or 38 degrees and take on the powers that be. You can do so many things using this collaborative crowdsourced culture, this peer-to-peer -peer network and hub. And looking at education, I think that the education that we need, the three qualities that we need, we don't need to depend on somebody else anymore. We can take it into our own hands. You've got artists like Akala, which will break down and give you social commentary on different issues through his album. You can look at Crash Course on YouTube and learn about world history 
in a five minute entertaining video. You can even get the world's best online courses for free. You can learn about macroeconomics, public speaking. All you need to do is go to your local library. All you need is an internet connection. And why is it important that we do this ourselves? Because if you look at the way that the human brain has evolved, we have three parts to the brain. The medulla, the cortex, and the neocortex. The medulla is responsible for your core survival needs. The cortex is responsible for your emotion, your feelings. And the neocortex, the most recently evolved, is in charge of your rational thinking, your analytical thought. And the interesting thing is this. The two older brains have an override capacity, meaning that survival trumps emotion. Emotion, in some cases, trumps logic. And when it comes to memory retention and concentration, the part of the brain that's responsible for these things is located within the emotional brain. So it's not just about what you're learning, but how you feel about it. That's why it's so easy to remember what your first kiss was like, or what your university campus looks like, or what your school canteen smelled like, because it's triggering a deep emotional response. And music, for example, has the power to evoke these deep emotions, to condition us create an anchor point to these things. And so, I'm not saying that school, college, or university are completely redundant. That would be far too simplistic a view. What I'm saying here is that formal education is actually the peel of the fruit. And if you want the really good stuff, you're going to have to get stuck in and squeeze that juice out because it's really worth it. We see in America, when we graduate, we throw our hats in the sky and we feel proud and we're completely free from education at last. But they often refer to it as commencement ceremonies. Why? Because to borrow a quote from Roland Barthes, the French literary theorist, the birth of the student is ransomed by the death of the teacher. It's about time that we took things into our own hands rather than depending on someone to give us the education that we want. It's time for responsibility. Educational freedom comes not from how prepared the lecturer is or the university is, how good the lesson plans are, how many nice whiteboards we have in a classroom of 30 kids. But it comes from the student's intellectual efforts to validate his or her values and beliefs according to how the three brains are interacting. We have more information than ever before. And these different pieces of information trigger different parts of the brain. So it's not just important what you read, but what you don't. And finally, I want to say to you all, if you're watching me right now, if you're listening to me right now, you are part of the 12%. When I was in Botswana working in a shelter for young girls for, who'd been sexually and physically abused, unfortunately during our time, the funding was cut. And these girls were living in a situation where they didn't have any running water. They didn't even have padlocks on the front door. A place that was meant to be a shelter had nothing. And there were a whole load of different girls there. And we saw, I saw that there was one in particular who, even though she didn't have any food, as you can see on the left, while the other girls would come home from school and watch TV and be watching music videos that would be conditioning them again through these responses, she'd take the tattered old books that had been dumped there and line them up really neatly and put up a sign at 5 o'clock every day. Peggy's Library, now open. An example of her freeing herself from this mental slavery. If you want to emancipate yourself, if you want to find the education that you need, you need to take both hands, grab it, and make it your own. Nobody can do that for you. And finally, I want to say to you all that we need people who come alive. We don't just need passive citizens who are mediocre, who are mediocre and just coasting through life. We need people who come alive, people who are buzzing with energy and passion. And only you can figure those things out according to the values, the dreams, the goals that you have. So just like a bee gathers pollen from different flowers, absorb what's useful, discard what isn't, and add what's uniquely your own. Ditch the degree, create your curriculum, become a social reformer. Thank you.